Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company and thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television and theatre and today we're joined by the wonderful Stella Hopkins to talk all things at least which is her new feature mm -hmm. film coming out and I know that this is a really personal project for you and so I was interested in kind of like what the gestation period was and how long you'd really been thinking about this when you finally sat down and started writing the script. Well, um... It's been a lifetime dream to uh, write and produce and direct a film. So the message is that it's never too late to accomplish a dream. But having said that, you know, you, you start to write a film, you start to write a script and it's, it, you think you have an idea, a story that you want to tell. But as a writer, what happens is that it starts to develop into something else. And it started going into a very like deeper place of my um, life's experience, having been affected by a member of my family um, with um, mental illness. So as I started to tap into my, the, you know, the lead, Elise, her pain, the main character's pain and and the family or you know, her family and everyone around her, how it affected them, I started really feeling like I knew it so well. I knew how they were feeling, I knew her feelings. And so that really helped in um, developing the story. Did you find yourself diving into any research aspects in terms of, of mental health and the trauma that you're- oh, Absolutely, absolutely. I had um, the privilege of working with Professor Dr. Chesky out of USC. He was my consultant on the film and went over every single detail because I wanted to make sure that, you know, the mental uh, health um, issue is a very serious and I wanted to treat it with great respect. Um, so I really went above and beyond to make sure that my facts were right and that I wasn't, of, of course, there's some creative liberties that you take, but um, and film magic that you wanted just to, be at, you know, I did make a film to entertain people a little bit, I hope, uh, to compel, to, to bring them, to make, to drive some kind of emotion, not necessarily entertain, but to create some sort of reaction. Um, so I, I, his, his input was absolutely essential. Without it, I wouldn't have been able to do it. That's so wonderful. And, you know, because it does have such a personal connection for you and it is something that you have experience with, how did you kind of approach the balance of, you know, making sure that you were including the, those personal details that are so vital to, to any project like this and at the same time balancing creative objectivity because there's always the push and pull between those two spaces when it's a really personal project? Right, well, you know, um, I attribute a lot of that to um, my cast and my lead, Elise, Lisa Pepper, um, and um, obviously the co-stars, Aaron Tucker and Tara Roy and, and my husband, Tony Hopkins. Uh, they were, re we sat around the table read and um, everyone had a real input. So we made some notes that were instrumental in the way the uh, story, you know, the script then, yeah, ended up, um, but Elise, Lisa, Pepper, um, we worked very closely together. First, she's uh, my dear friend. We've been friends for over 20 years. And so we really, she said, you know, she herself goes, uh, has experiences of unfortunate condition of um, pain. And so physical pain. Um, so she understood, maybe it's not mental illness, but she understood what being held hostage by, by something outside of yourself that you, or within yourself that you couldn't, you know, express in words necessarily, because pain, how do you express level one to 10? That doesn't really do it. Or how do you really manifest what's going on internally? So she really took the character and gave it her own dimension. Um, so I attribute some of, you know, what we ended up with to her. Yeah. And as well as you and Lisa being friends for so long, she was also in Slipstream, which you produced. And so yeah. it's interesting if you had had a chance to kind of like see directly how she works in and what was the most conducive space for her to have as a performer, or if that was something that the two of you kind of like navigated and figured out on set together as a director and actor. 
Well, you know, we sort of instinctively knew, um, you know, we have that kind of relationship as friends that we don't really need a lot of words to understand each other. So it was just like this, this beautiful, you know, dance of, you know, great, I really uh, believe in her great talent as an actor. Mm -hmm. So just watching her own the character um, and vice versa. She enjoyed taking direction and, and my intuition and, and the, my personal history with the, with the subject matter. Um, you know, and I also have to say that the music. So when I, my, you know, Tony composed the music, he did the score for the film. When I sat with him and I said, you know, even before the script was finished, I said, the music is, in, is like a character within the film. It, it, it's that silent internal voice of hers where she, there are moments of lucidity, moments where she feels whole. And it's that lullaby that she kind of hums to herself. There's like this internal silence of beautiful music and he took it and he interpreted it in a way that I couldn't have imagined. And it just turned out beautiful. The so music for me really, uh, and I'm not being biased, it's probably, and the cinematography, because Dante Spinotti is without a doubt a legend, uh, and my the cast, my all my my the, you know actors, but the music, uh, the music was just delightful. It created that character that uh, it gave it life. I used very at the very opening of the film. I have no dialogue, and I purposely did that because I wanted to introduce the film with the music. And, you know, that kind of gave it, set the tone for it. Um, so, yeah, I thought, I, you know, I, I love the music. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, you, you know, and it does kind of like play a really important role throughout. And because you were mentioning as well, the, the scope of those scenes where your central character is catatonic after, you know, having a really traumatic breakdown from an experience that she's had. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the unique challenges and the specificity of those scenes and how they were different in terms of writing them and working with Lisa on her performance, because, she, you know, there's ultimately no dialogue from her character for a large portion of the film. So you have to think about character portrayal in a different way at that point. Correct. So with regards to the um, catatonia, um, again, research and um, the, the um, doctor, Dr. Shashki was instrumental in telling us, well, this is what happens. You know, these are the, these are the signs, the various symptoms the onset, how long, it, you know, how it's treated the medicine. And I said to Lisa, I said, how do you feel about having, you know, basically you go silent for, you know, throughout, you know, the second part of the film, you're silent and it's all physical. Um, and she said, you know, I'm, I, I can do this. The silence uh, that the part required was actually very powerful and, and that it gave Lisa an ability to use her body memory of the internal pain that she feels in her life. And that really um, added a dimension to her part that I don't think I would have been able to achieve with an actress that didn't understand that physical pain and being trapped by physical pain. So it was, you know, sometimes our scars are the biggest foundation of like the um, of our lives they give us. So the, her pain was the foundation to that character. Yeah, I also thought it was interesting that you used the film to kind of look at the portray and portray the relationship between a patient and between carers. So we have you know, a nurse who's with her once she's been admitted and is an inpatient, but prior to that scenes within a therapy office um, with Anthony Hopkins playing the therapist at that point. And so I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the way in which you wanted to explore that those relationships as well, because they offer such an interesting dynamic. You mean between uh, Dr. Lewis Phillip and Elise? Mm -hmm. Right, so the, he was the head psychiatrist, you know, he, he plays the role of the Dr. Lewis, the head psychiatrist. And um, she's, I'm not gonna give too much of the story away, but she has a relationship with him. And very often what happens in that dynamic, uh, especially um, with, um, uh, you know, it happens in clinical 
settings that the patient has an admiration to say it mildly for the therapist. Um, and it starts to become a, sort of like a delusional attachment, a delusional connection uh, based on, you know, whatever their fantasy is. Um, so there's a, there was a little bit of that. And um, ultimately, um, she really likes some because it's, it's really his medical protocol and his care that gives her the promise of a new life. So there is, she, I think he's the only one that she really trusts at some point in, you know, throughout the, you know, the arc of the character and how it, you know, there's trust uh, and the nurse. Um, so, so I don't want to tell more, but I don't know how much you use. Yeah. I don't want to give it away. Was it that element of like the admiration and trust that she feels for him that led to a lot of the choices that you made in, cause there's a two-hander scene where she's in his office and it's filmed very intimately in terms of the space that they're in, in, in terms of the camera work that you utilize and the way that you light that specific scene. So did that lead to a lot of the choices that you made visually? Yes, it did. Um, absolutely. And um, that was that scene really, um, you know, it's up to the viewer to feel whether it really happened or whether that was in her imagination. That's how she envisioned it happening. Mm -hmm. And in terms of a, a visual standpoint for the film overall, you play around with part of the film being black and white and part of it being in color. And so I wanted to ask about the point when you were scripting it out and kind of starting to imagine how you wanted the film to look on screen, the point at which you realized that that was gonna be one of the storytelling tools that was important to you. I knew that very, from the very beginning that I wanted to use black and white um, as part of my uh, uh, like uh, character again. Uh, light lighting is important in the film, so lighting and the music were characters, and um, I knew at what point I wanted to bring color um, to present where we reveal um, the condition that she lives with. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning Dante earlier, who's your, your cinematographer, who's done everything from Heat and LA Confidential to Ant-Man and the Wasp and is really remarkable. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about your collaborative relationship with him and, and in particular as well, kind of like how you worked collaboratively as you were communicating what that visual look and feel was that you really wanted him to be able to come in and execute for you. Thank you for asking because I'm I'm a big Dante Spinotti fan and so I can't sing enough praises for the man. But having said that, when I talked to him, sent him the script and he called me and he said, I love it, I wanna do it. And I explained to him about the light. I said, it, it saturates, you know, the house is clinical, saturated in this white light, almost like everything is a bland, you know, washed out existence and he understood it the scene that um you know because you have limited budget so i couldn't do all the bells and whistles of like an accident scene you you know that takes a lot of money and i said and he goes but how are we going to do this and, you know and the and i said this particular scene and i said well i gave him a thorough explanation i said you know First of all, I don't like gore. I don't want it to be this bloody, horrible thing going on. And I don't have the money for all the bells and whistles to do it right. But I said, I have a trick. I said, I think we could do it like this. And he goes, I, I see it and that's genius. And I, felt, and I felt like Dante's telling me I'm a genius. Oh my God, this is unbelievable. <laughs> so I was flattered. That's a fantastic. In, 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 his beautiful Italian, in his beautiful Italian way, you could understand that's even more flattering. Yeah. I also wanted to ask a little bit about the production design and, and the location, you know, even just specifically down to the details of the home that the central couple live in, because you use it as a tool to kind of like tell us a lot about the, their dynamic with each other, their family life, kind of how they interact with others around them, even just through the house that you chose and the way that you film it. Again, uh, thank you for noticing, because I very specifically wanted a what very sort of cold architectural clinical home dash almost mausoleum you know it's like very sterile um and i it was so specific i needed this window to overlook the driveway to overdo this 
And people, you know, they were saying that's impossible. We have to have it. It's not gonna, you know, it's crazy. It's gotta be this. And we found this perfect location. So yeah, again, just that those, the very architectural design and cold and the, you know, the lines and feel felt like an office building, like a hospital. <laughs> And one of the props that you really utilize at the beginning is kind of the central focus on a Wizard of Oz book. And was, was that down to the visual aesthetic that you were choosing between black and white and color or kind of like, I was just really interested in how you wanted to use that as a storytelling tool so early on in the film. Well, it's, you know, she has a child. So you think that a mother has a favorite book with the child that they read together. And the book um, has a few lines. And if it's the first line in the movie, if you walk far enough, says Dorothy, you one day you might you one day we might get someplace. And I thought, that's life, you know, that's life. <laughs> you keep, you know, and I thought, and if you're and in the mind of this character that is so lonely and so um beaten up, uh, she wouldn't want to walk so far to get some place of peace. And I get tearful because I understand that character so well, you know, um, from a, like, again, just personal history. And not only was I personally in my home afflicted with my mother who was an undiagnosed schizophrenic, but um, my neighbor, um, I witnessed her demise um she jumped out of the window when i was um about seven and i used to observe her i knew she, there was something wrong with her she would walk and i'd follow her sometimes like she would walk and she had this very sort of languid slow downtrodden walk mm -hmm. and i know you've seen it in the film um, because I used it as a, as a reference, because I just would never forget that walk. Like mm -hmm. the whole world was on her shoulders and just like couldn't put one foot in front of the other. And um, so, yeah, so it just brings me back, you know, talking about it brings me back to the source of the story, which of course always kind of gets a little triggers emotion. Yeah, it also feels like you bring kind of a personal understanding to to Elise's loneliness that she experiences even within her own home. And we wanted to ask a little bit about how that impacted and influenced the dialogue and the way that you wrote it and, and the, the choice of words between her and her husband within that, because they're communicating with each other, but they're not really communicating with each other at the same time because there's such a distance between them. Right, well, Aaron Tucker, who is, um great actor um, who's raised on stage in magic he, with his mother, who's, uh, who's also in the film, um, Goldie, Frances Tucker. Um, she plays Goldie. And um, he, you know, in having a conversation, he's, you know, he, he developed the character and he said to me, you know, he's remote, he's beat up by her. He's been living with this eccentric mother-in-law who comes in, you know, we have this nanny and I'm raising this, you know, this little girl who's now a young lady and I'm just tired. I'm tired of the whole dynamic of, of being, you know, the caring husband and father and just so my words are chosen. I'm, I'm just kind of going along with the motions of being present, but tired um, and nothing that he was doing could get her to come around because that's what people with mental illness, you know, spouses, parents, they always think that another trip, um, another house, a child, that it's going to change. And unfortunately, mental illness doesn't work that way. Mental illness is something that needs to be treated um, professionally. And the family, uh, usually the family of bipolar, uh, people affected with bipolar or schizophrenia or any mental illness, the family, the loved ones have, uh, there's still so much to learn. And so it takes, it takes, a, um, takes a lot of love, a lot of patience and, and also groups and support groups because I don't think it's something that one can do alone um, with, and within a home and raise a family and have a spouse or have a, a child that is afflicted with mental illness and think that you can do it alone. Yeah. 
On, on kind of like a separate note, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience as a first time filmmaker. You've worked in a variety of facets within the industry before and, you know, producing and, and performing as well. But this was your first time kind of writing and directing and really just spearheading a, a, a feature. And so I wanted to ask about what kind of like the, the biggest learning curves were, but also what the really valuable things were that you'd picked up on productions and sets that you'd worked on and been involved in before. Well, um, I lived in Sweden for seven years with a... Um, renowned film director Gunnar Hellström and during my time in Sweden I had the privilege of meeting some of you know the best Lee Volman, Bergman and uh, really loved Bergman's films. Uh, I used some of his you know cinematography, his way of developing a story uh, for my film. I was inspired by Persona um, and just and just the you know Scandinavian kind of melancholic uh, Bergman like film noir you know kind of art film that that a re that really speaks indie film <laughs> from a first time auteur so definitely that was a huge. Um, time, a, a, a part of my life, a chunk of my life where I was like a hungry student. I was very young and I was just taking it all in. Like one day I will do this. And then life, you know, goes on and I meet Tony and we get married and we do, we create Slipstream together. But again, very busy, you know, he's working nonstop and, uh, and I want, you know, I was newly married sort of. So I wanted to be the, the, the housewife, the wife that, you know, goes along with the husband. And, and then one morning, a few years ago, I woke up and I said to him, I said, I've, the student has graduated. <laughs> Those were my exact words. I said, a little late. I said, but better late than never. He had just finished the uh, dresser with um, Richard Ayer's director and watching Richard Ayer direct, I think it was the culmination. Yeah, like he was the professor that it was my graduating class, just watching the elegance in which he directed that set. And his, you know, and he's no spring chicken <laughs> and the manner, but of course he's been doing this forever. Uh, but just his, um, again, very low budget, mm -hmm. but the, t the actors, of course, just strong, beautiful actors but I just watched how he took a command of the set without being in overbearingly command in command. I, and it just, it was like watching a beautiful orchestrated uh, orchestra. I told him that in fact, I said, watching you direct is like watching a conductor conducting an orchestra. And he says, that's the most beautiful compliment. And I said, well, it's true. So that gave me, kind of like, okay, I have wings. Those are my, I'm, I, I can do this. I feel internally all these years from, you know, my mid late twenties to today, I'm ready. And um, I wish I would have had more money, more time, but you know, it, it's, it is what it is. I think every, every single filmmaker says that about <laughs> projects it's always there if we had more time we had more money uh, and I wanted to ask you as well just kind of kind of wrapping out is there is there a particular scene or aspect of making this film that, that you're proudest of now that you have the chance to kind of sit back and reflect on it um absolutely I I love I love the scene in the bar mm -hmm. I love Carmen's performance I love Lisa's ability to have her fantasy, live out her fantasy and show, you know, it really gave her range. It really allowed the film to give her, I mean, complete uh, platform for the range of her as, a, as an actor and for Tara Arroyev. It was just, it was stunning. I am very proud of uh, I designed that uh, beautiful costume that Tara Roy of wore and kind of the whole ambiance and Lisa and just that, that scene um, and the song. And the song was very special to me and I was very fortunate to get it. Um, 
that was a whole project in itself, Besame Mucho, because that was my one of my mother's favorite songs. And she, my mother was a, not an opera singer professional, but she was a, a singer and an opera aficionado and she would sing beautifully. And that was one of her favorite songs. So I just wanted to use it in the film. That's so beautiful that you had the chance to include that, that nod to your mom. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you got the chance to, to make this film and to tell a story thank that was you. so personal and thank so important. You. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.